Okay, it is uh, two minutes past the hour. And so with uh, the approval from my colleagues, why don't we get started? <clears throat> my name is Craig Allen and I'm the president of the US China Business Council. And I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining this press conference on the release of the 2022 US Export Report. This report provides a snapshot of US goods exports in 2021, US service exports in 2020, and the number of American jobs created by this export activity based on 2020 goods and services export data. These are the most recent annual data figures available. So today we are releasing national, state, and congressional district export figures. These figures represent a rather complex story of American exports to China, which have been buffeted by COVID and travel restrictions, the tariffs initially imposed by President Trump, which of course were reciprocated by Chinese tariffs on US exports, the phase one agreement, uh, sanctions and export controls, and also of course, the changing and ever evolving Chinese marketplace. Like all data, this uh, report has uh, its limits. Uh, for example, we look in this report only at uh, US export side of the ledger, and we do not discuss Chinese imports and or the numbers of Americans working for Chinese based companies doing business and investing across the United States. Another limit of the data is that US government's data release for goods and service exports is not synchronous. We have full goods export data for 2021, but our services export data is for 2020. This limits the precision by which we can estimate the number of jobs created by US exports to China. Also, the job numbers included in this report are based on direct and indirect uh, jobs associated with recorded exports. And the specific methodology used here is provided by the trade partnership, and it is based on the Bureau of Export Analysis and Moody's Analytics methodology. We could discuss that more if you are interested. While recognizing the limits of the data, I should also point out that this data really does have great utility, especially when you look at it from a local, uh, a state or a regional uh, perspective. First, we can look at state or congressional district uh, level data and get a pretty clear, uh, clear picture on how export sales to China are impacting that particular state or community. And as a, a, a parenthetical remark here, I think it's kind of interesting to note uh, that there are four states for whom China is their largest market. And they would include Alaska, Nebraska, Oregon, South Dakota. And in addition to that, uh, there are 15 states for which China is their second largest market, Delaware, Georgia, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Maryland, Minnesota, North Carolina, North Dakota, New Mexico, South Carolina, Virginia, Vermont, and West Virginia. And in total, there are 38 states for which China is uh, in their top three markets. So how uh, China fares as an export market is indeed very important for a good number of American states. Uh, second, uh, as with all data, it's really the trends that are important. We can estimate 
uh, whether the job numbers are going up or down in a particular state or community over the last year. Uh, and given the size of the China market, as well as the volatility inherent in US-China trade, the swings can be quite dramatic. Uh, also, we can clearly see the impact of trade policy uh, or the trade policy process on businesses at the community level. The phase one agreement was a real tailwind for some constituencies, uh, especially agriculture, but an unwelcome headwind uh, for other industries. And this data gives you a pretty good idea of who are the relative winners and who are the relative losers as a result of the phase one agreement and overall trade policy. So before we get into the data, uh, let me make a number of uh, other uh, comments. As you will see from this data, US exports to China are only one example of how US companies are doing business with Chinese companies and Chinese consumers. And that these exports and all of this business is a stabilizing force within the bilateral relationship. And looking ahead, uh, while we have had two great years of rapidly growing US exports uh, to China, the growth of these exports is by no means assured. Uh, the future of US exports to China depends uh, on uh, many factors, many of which are completely outside of our control. For example, one, whether the phase one deal continues to deliver benefits for US exporters and whether further negotiations occur to build out the phase one agreement and in perhaps a phase two agreement. Uh, also, whether the US Section 301 tariffs remain in effect, especially without uh, the broader exclusions, and whether or not additional US tariffs are imposed, which will probably lead to additional Chinese tariffs or other restrictions on US exports. And a third factor that we uh, have difficulty uh, knowing is whether any US administration actions or congressional legislations will lead to further retaliation by China against US exports. Yet another uncertainty would be whether or not China crosses any red lines uh, with regard to perhaps selling weapons to Russia for use in Ukraine to which the, United, the US administration may then uh, uh, sanction Chinese com companies, which could uh, complicate the ability of US companies uh, to sell into the market. And the biggest uncertainty perhaps of them all is COVID. Uh, will COVID continue to spread in China and will it prevent Chinese tourists or students from traveling to the United States in the coming months, affecting uh, US services exports and potentially much more broadly affecting overall US exports. And we don't know the answer to that. So as the Biden administration and Congress consider taking actions related to supporting US competitiveness and national security vis-a-vis -vis China, they should keep these very pragmatic uh, subject of US exports uh, in mind and uh, consider the impact that they will have on US companies, farmers, ranchers, factories, uh, exporters and sellers in doing business in China. The impact uh, on, of policy has a very direct impact on US exports. So with that very long wind up, uh, let me summarize the key findings uh, from USCBC's US export uh, report. 
uh, after my presentations, um, I'd uh, like to take your questions, but um, I'll also make very brief comments on um, the overall trade balance in 2021. Um, U.S. exports uh, are only one side of the ledger. I'll also catch you up uh, very quickly on what we know of uh, 2022 exports. And then just a reminder um, that this is all about real companies, real people facing real problems, trying to make a living uh, uh, in exporting in part uh, to China. So with that, uh, Ian, uh, can we uh, go to the next slide, uh, please? So um, again, uh, the disclaimer is that the goods figures are from 2021, while the services uh, and jobs figures are from 2020 due to the lag in data release of service exports. We expect to have full 2021 data for services and um, goods exports jobs together uh, for 2021 in the fall. Um, so we'll get into the specific um, of these numbers later, but first allow me uh, to set the scene at the national level. Um, so the good news, uh, the great news is that uh, US uh, goods exports to China hit an all time high in 2021, marking a 21% increase from the previous year and exceeding the pre-pandemic and pre-trade war uh, totals. As you'll see here, uh, the uh, services exports in contrast uh, dropped uh, by one third uh, in 2020 compared uh, to 2019. Um, uh, US uh, uh, goods exports uh, in China uh, in uh, 2020 were up 18 percent. So between 2020 and uh, 2021, we had a very significant rise, uh, two great years in U.S. Uh, goods exports. But uh, at the top level, the data show uh, that overall employment uh, provided by U.S. exports uh, to China fell 0.5, uh, fell 5 percent. And the reason uh, for that is uh, the 33% decline uh, in services exports in uh, 2020. Those services exports are much more labor intensive uh, than uh, the goods exports. So that's the overall uh, uh, picture. Uh, let's carry on, please. Okay, so again, uh, a... Uh, very nice increase in uh, U.S. exports uh, to China uh, from 2019 up uh, to uh, 2021 uh, and continuing into 2022. Um, so American goods exports uh, to China have benefited industries and communities across the United States in 2021. Uh, which of course was a year of economic recovery for uh, the United States. And who are the standout uh, performers here? Uh, in terms of industrial sectors, uh, oil seeds and grain exports saw a growth of 4.8 billion um, as farmers sent uh, 21.9 billion worth of uh, crops uh, to China. Uh, semiconductor sales uh, and oil and gas sales uh, rose very significantly in 2021. And pharmaceuticals and medicines did really extremely well in uh, 2021. The number uh, that uh, the Department of Agriculture is using for overall uh, US ag export increase in 2021 is 35% increase. And that uh, for US agricultural exporters, including uh, meat, uh, grains, uh, soybeans, and all other agricultural exports uh, uh, are certainly at a record uh, number, up 35% over the year. Next, please. So this um, graph 
uh, gives you an idea of how diverse uh, the U.S. export uh, portfolio uh, is uh, to China. As noted, uh, oil, seeds, and grains are, in 2021, uh, the largest uh, export category that we had, followed by semiconductors uh, and uh, oil and gas. I would like to note, um, kind of in the middle on the right of your screen, that aerospace uh, products and parts were 4.7 billion. And that is a considerable drop uh, from, our, uh, from the standard over the last, well, 20 years, um, and certainly was a drag on overall uh, US exports. And we hope to see a recovery in U.S. aircraft sales uh, in uh, 2022. But as you could see, this is a diverse mixture of, uh, of exports uh, covering uh, nearly every sector. Next, please. Okay, so who are the winners? Where are the winners uh, in terms of uh, goods exports uh, to China uh, last year? And you'll see in the, uh, in the Plains uh, states, uh, a dark uh, blue uh, indicating uh, that their exports uh, to China uh, were uh, especially strong uh, in 2021. Um, this uh, is data at the district level, and, and we'll go through a couple of examples of how you could drill down uh, as, as, as reporters uh, down to the district le le level once we uh, finish uh, this uh, overview. Um, but across the board, uh, or almost across the board, we could see uh, that goods exports to China were up from last year and way up uh, from 2019 when companies felt the full weight of tariffs and uh, retaliatory uh, tariffs. So especially strong for agriculture and energy sales, uh, despite the retali retaliatory tariffs. Uh, next, please. So while the goods exports uh, stories is an excellent um, story of recovery, unfortunately, the services exports uh, of by American companies and individuals uh, to China are almost uh, the mirror opposite. Uh, they, we have had a very uh, poor year in 2020. And as I noted before, while we don't have the 2021 figures, we expect a very little recovery in 2021 and very uncertain about 2022. Um, and as noted before, uh, US uh, service exports in 2020 fell 33%. Uh, from uh, the previous year. And this had a tremendous uh, knock-on effect uh, for uh, employment. Uh, so uh, when we break this down, uh, we see that travel, personal travel and business travel were down 90% in 2020. Um, and um, down uh, roughly 90% while health travel was down 79%. Uh, so states and localities that depend heavily on the tourism industry uh, were heavily impacted by this. For example, Nevada and Hawaii uh, saw their service exports to China decline uh, by roughly 70% in 2020. And the travel uh, restrictions also had a ripple impact uh, on another industry, and that is education. Exports of education services uh, to China, think uh, tuition paid by Chinese students, uh, which is of course the largest demographic of all international students at, the United, uh, in the, at US universities, dropped by 19% uh, in 2020. Uh, COVID is, of course, the most important factor here, but we shouldn't only limit it uh, to COVID. In addition, uh, visa policy uh, has also been uh, a cogent uh, uh, issue 
uh, for many uh, Chinese uh, traveling to the United States uh, for uh, travel, business, or education. Uh, and it is unclear uh, to what degree we will see a recovery in travel and education uh, in the post-COVID uh, era. So next slide, please. So this is a uh, schematic uh, that shows the importance of uh, different industries in service exports uh, to the United States. Um, as uh, noted uh, on your left, uh, education provided 11.6 billion, but that was down 19% uh, percent in uh, 2020 from uh, the previous year. And travel and tourism, which is on your center right, uh, uh, no, uh, designated here as personal travel uh, and tourism was down uh, 90% uh, uh, over uh, the course of 2020. And I suspect that there has been no recovery uh, in 2021 uh, while we do not have uh, this data yet. Let us hope uh, that this schematic will look very different uh, in 2022 and 2023 uh, with a return uh, to normal uh, international travel, uh, particularly for those uh, uh, destinations uh, that rely uh, on international tourism, uh, such as Hawaii, uh, Nevada, and uh, many others. Um, let's go on. Um, thank you. Um, so this map, uh, shows um, that nearly every state, that every state exported less in services in 2020 than they had in 2019 across the board. Uh, but to put this into context, uh, the state with the, the least contraction was North Dakota, which experienced a 19% uh, contraction in service exports uh, to uh, China. So virtually across the board, uh, states lost uh, jobs and uh, employment and exports uh, to China uh, across all of uh, the services uh, industry. So quite a bleak picture. So let's put uh, the goods exports next, please. Let's put the goods exports and uh, the services exports uh, together and talk about uh, jobs created in 2020 over 2019. And again, this is because the services export data lags uh, a year. Uh, and so we're only able to present 2020, but I am quite confident that the 2021 data will look uh, very similar uh, to this with a little bit brighter uh, blues. Those are blues will be a little bit brighter yet uh, and uh, uh, those uh, that rely on uh, services will be uh, redder yet. So while the number of jobs supported by U.S. goods and services uh, exports to China contract, contracted or shrank by 5% in 2020, uh, this is likely due to the 33% uh, decrease in service exports to China that year. And you could see here uh, some of the regions clearly benefited from increased uh, goods exports, mostly the agriculture and the energy states, and uh, others uh, uh, did not do as well. So growth in agricultural product uh, exports from the heartland saw big increases in jobs uh, uh, supported by exports from Illinois, Minnesota, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. But we saw continued declines of aerospace uh, exports mirrored uh, by decreasing job numbers in South Carolina's 6th district and Washington's 2nd district. And interestingly, strong semiconductor sales uh, related uh, to strong uh, jobs growth in Oregon's 1st uh, district. Now I'm gonna turn it over uh, to my good colleague, Ian Hutchinson now, uh, to show you, to demonstrate uh, how to use uh, this data. And then I will make a few concluding remarks and then we'll take your questions. Thank you. Ian? All right, uh, how are you guys out there? Um, can you see my screen here that says US export report at the very top? 
Yes. All right. Um, so this is the currently unpublished page because our report is going to go live at 1 p.m. Um, but so this is what the main landing report page is going to look like. You'll be able to find it um, both as a link afterwards that we'll send since you registered, and also you'll just be able to find it on our homepage, uschina.org. Um, the bulk of the text here at the very top is essentially what Craig has just run through for everyone in the past 25 minutes or so. Um, so this is generally all the, the top line data that Craig's hit. And then if you scroll down, you can read the full report here. Um, it will be the same as the embargoed copy that you received, except it won't have a watermark. But the interesting stuff is here at the bottom. So you have two sections, one of them for the state level and one of them for the congressional district level. So as part of this report launch every year, we have two sets of individual reports. We have one for every single state in the union plus the District of Columbia. And then we have another set of individual pages for every single congressional district plus DC. So at the state level, you can open up and you can download the whole set of pages if you'd like. Um, but if say you want a particular state, they're all listed below. So I'm from Indiana, we'll just choose Indiana. So you can click on Indiana, it will start at the top and then it will jump you down to the state you're looking at. So every single state page will give you a chart over time of goods exports to China, a chart over time of services exports to China, um, the top export markets for both, and then the top exports themselves for both, as well as what percentage of those goods or services went to China. So that percentage is um, the percentage of that state's total exports that went to China. Um, so every single state has one of these reports. And then likewise, on the congressional, congressional district level, every single congressional district has a page. So say you want to check Massachusetts second, you can just click on Massachusetts. It will open up the PDF, it will load, and it will bring you down to Massachusetts. Um, and there you are, Massachusetts second right there. And again, same information, jobs, goods, services, top markets, top exports, and the percentage of those exports. Um, so you can download the full set or you can go searching for specific ones, but every single area in the union is covered there. So lots of data to, to dig into there. Okay, um, uh, thank you very much, Ian. Great job. Um, uh, this data really is uh, very helpful, uh, particularly uh, if you're researching uh, a particular city or a particular state or a particular uh, commodity. Let me just take a, a, a couple of minutes uh, to conclude and then I'd be delighted to take uh, questions. Um, I think that, as I noted, uh, the export data is just export data and we don't uh, cover uh, in this report import data, but of course imports are, are very important. Um, so I would uh, like to note, uh, just for the sake of, um, um, completing the picture that um, uh, in uh, uh, 2021, annual goods imports from China, uh, according to US statistics, were up 16.3%. Uh, uh, so um, uh, Chinese exports to the United States uh, up 16.3%. Uh, uh, and uh, because uh, both Chinese exports were up and US exports were up, um, uh, the trade deficit, uh, the U.S.-China trade deficit in 2021 uh, was also up. Um, uh, the bilateral U.S.-China trade deficit last year was uh, up 14.3%, uh, up to 355 uh, billion dollars in 2021. So while U.S. exporters uh, did very well, Chinese exporters did uh, very well, despite uh, the tariffs um, in, in place. Um, and let me also uh, just take a, a, a brief note, uh, just a second, uh, to talk about what we're seeing in 2022. And I have to say that this is only after uh, two months of uh, data. And I would say on uh, the export side, on a month by month uh, comparison, it's, it's uh, that we can't discern a trend yet. Um, up 1% uh, uh, in February, but down in January. So not really anything uh, meaningful to say yet uh, about 2022 uh, US exports. Uh, in 2022, 
uh, Chinese exports uh, to the US uh, were down 3.4% uh, 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 in January and down 11% in February. I, I think that you know, it's really not useful uh, to make uh, too much of these numbers, but I wanted to include it uh, simply because uh, for the sense of uh, trying to give a, a complete, uh, a, a complete uh, picture here. Um, I think that uh, to, to wind down, you know, the numbers are the numbers and the numbers are important. Uh, we need uh, good uh, analytical uh, data. Um, but I, I would like to note that behind all these exports are real people and, and, and real companies uh, who are, uh, that are trying to make a living uh, and working hard, uh, but facing real problems. And so uh, let me just uh, mention a couple of them uh, to remind us uh, that this is about uh, uh, people and communities. So let me mention uh, three uh, small and medium-sized enterprises um, uh, that, that we work with, that, that we interview as part of our 50-50 uh, project, which is all available on our website. They'll be able to get more information about all these companies on our website. Uh, but let's uh, talk about Kaizen uh, in Tennessee. This is a, a small, medium-sized enterprise in Nashville that exports environmentally responsible cleaning technologies for use in electronics and other manufacturing. And he, uh, Tom, is concerned about uh, bilateral tensions and the fear of decoupling, particularly uh, in uh, the electronics industry. Or we could talk about companies facing rising costs uh, due to tariffs and uh, increased uh, shipping uh, uh, times, uh, a, a problem that affects almost every uh, company. Um, we could, uh, and to exemplify this, we could talk about uh, David uh, Shogren, president of U.S. International Foods, a small exporter of American-made uh, uh, packaged foods based in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. And he noted uh, that their exports to China were pretty much uh, killed off uh, by increased uh, tariffs. So their potato sticks had been uh, very popular in China, but when tariffs doubled, uh, it made the retail price uncompetitive and other uh, competitors quickly filled that void. Or we could talk about uh, the issues associated uh, with COVID and travel restrictions. Uh, John Mellon, president and COO of Brown and Haley produces uh, almond Roca brand candles. And they're concerned about the travel restrictions because most of their products are sold at, uh, at, in airports uh, and, uh, and to tourists uh, in Hong Kong. And to the extent uh, that, uh, to the large extent that tourism has been uh, hit, uh, therefore uh, their sales are also uh, way down. So uh, details of the people behind these companies and many others can be found on uh, the 50 states and 50 stories webpage uh, that we have on our website. And we'd be happy to connect you with them if you're interested uh, in uh, additional uh, stories. The numbers are the numbers, uh, but behind all the numbers are people, our families, our companies, our people trying to make a living uh, in very, very uncertain times. Then let me close uh, by saying that uh, indeed because of COVID, uh, because of tariffs, uh, because of international tensions, there has never, been such uncertainty uh, for companies, uh, for farmers, uh, workers, uh, and ranchers. I would note that we had two spectacular years where U.S. goods exports in total increased nearly 40%. Um, that is excellent, um, but uh, it is not destined uh, to continue. And indeed, uh, the policies of both the Chinese government and the U.S. government will have an enormous impact uh, on uh, the potential 
for continued increases in U.S. good exports and hopefully a recovery in American services exports in 2022 and beyond. So with that, uh, let me stop here. And I would be uh, very grateful for the opportunity uh, to take any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you. Um, and as we start the Q&A section, um, just as a kind of housekeeping note, there are two ways that you can, you can ask a question. You can either use the typed Q&A function or you can use the raise hand function if you'd like to uh, ask a question directly. Um, and to that point, I see that Dong Hoi Yu has their hand up. Um, so I'm going to allow you to talk. So Dong Hoi, if you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Dong Hoi. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing this. I actually have two questions. Uh, one question. Now that the trade war started by President Trump has been declared a failure by many people, why does this war still continue? Do you have any insight of Biden administration's review of its trade policy toward China? This is the one question. The second question, did you see any implications of Ukraine war for US-China trade relations not only something such as uh, secondary sanctions, but also China's purchasing grains or gas from the United States. Thank you very oh, much. So energy, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dong Hui, appreciate that. Um, so uh, I think that um, <laughs> Uh, the trade uh, between China and the United States, as our data shows, uh, remains very unbalanced. Uh, and indeed, uh, the trade deficit um, uh, or the trade imbalance uh, between the United States and China increased uh, last year, uh, despite uh, the um, uh, despite the tariffs uh, going both ways. Um, so. Um, uh, I think most of the members of the U.S.-China Business Council, if not all, would consider uh, the tariffs and the trade war uh, to have been an, a mistaken approach uh, to this uh, issue. And uh, we listened to candidate uh, uh, Biden uh, talk about uh, his uh, agreement uh, that the tariffs were uh, a disaster, uh, to use his words, uh, but they have not been repealed and they have barely been um, uh, uh, modified. Uh, and indeed, uh, the exclusions that were just recently granted uh, by USTR were very modest uh, indeed, much more so uh, than, than we would have liked. Uh, but it is true that the uh, Biden uh, trade policy, not only with regard to China, but, but with regard to China also, but I would say in general, uh, is very similar uh, to the, the, the Trump uh, trade policy. And uh, that is uh, a, a, to focus on uh, the defensive uh, elements of trade uh, on tariffs and uh, countervailing duties and anti-dumping. Uh, rather than the opportunities uh, of uh, trade. And I think that uh, uh, many of us would find that uh, very frustrating that we believe uh, that 95% of uh, the world's uh, consumers are outside of the United States and we want uh, better access to those markets, more access to those markets. We, we have confidence that we could compete anywhere in the world on a level playing field um, but um, but the the protectionist uh, policies uh, remain uh, in place. Um, so I think it's quite remarkable that despite the the, the tariffs, uh, these uh, uh, the exports uh, from both China and the United States have risen quite briskly uh, in uh, twenty uh, twenty one. I think an interesting question uh, to ask ourselves is what if there were no trade war? What if there were no trade tariffs? And I like the work of uh, Chad Bound of the Peterson Institute, uh, 
uh, who suggests that without trade tariffs, without any tariffs, U.S. exports would be a, approximately 19% higher uh, than they are currently. Um, and so from that uh, perspective, uh, this, uh, we've, we've paid a high price uh, for this trade uh, war. Um, uh, we are hopeful that the two governments uh, will enter into negotiations to bring down uh, the tariffs as soon as possible. And while I see no sign of that, uh, we, were, we encourage both governments uh, to negotiate uh, uh, a reduction uh, of the tariffs in return for better market access and more competitive markets uh, in China. Uh, on uh, Ukraine, I think it's really too early uh, to uh, note uh, any uh, changes in exports uh, from the United States uh, to China on the oil and gas side. Uh, I know uh, that uh, the commodity markets are very uh, stressed uh, right now, prices are high, so there's a lot of factors uh, involved, uh, not only where the molecules are going, uh, but also the price of those molecules. Uh, uh, so I don't think that we see this in the data yet. Um, uh, it's something uh, that we need to watch out for uh, in uh, the months uh, ahead. U.S. energy sales uh, to China were uh, fantastic uh, in 2021. Uh, I would have expected them and do expect them to continue to increase uh, in 2022. Um, but you're right uh, that we need to keep our eyes on that data uh, to ensure, uh, to, to, to really understand empirically uh, what is uh, going on uh, in uh, those markets. There's a restructuring, particularly of the oil market, and uh, <clears throat> that's global. And we really don't know how that'll impact us uh, bilaterally with regard to our exports in China. Something uh, that I'd love to talk uh, about uh, maybe in six months. So thank you very much. All right, um, I see David Lauder. David, I just allowed you to talk. Uh, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, thanks, David. Hey, uh, thanks, Greg. Um, I'm just wondering, <clears throat> Going forward, I mean, obviously, some of the some of the increase, um, I guess, could be attributed to the uh, the the phase one trade deal. I mean, the, the China China did, you know, they said that, that they said that they were trying to uh, meet meet their targets, uh, but COVID got in the way. Uh, but certainly, uh, the increase in in the ag, ag sector was was the most prominent one. Um, what are you expecting going forward now that this thing has expired and um, you know, the, 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 the Biden administration has kind of hinted around that it might consider additional actions, um, you know, perhaps an, another 301 action, uh, other, other tools to try to um, uh, combat uh, China's efforts to target specific industries for domination and all that. Um, are you concerned that, that this could lead to uh, a, a, a a dropping off that that maybe 2021 was a was a blip uh, that we might not see that same kind of trajectory going forward. And then, um, you know, have, just wondering sort of what your evidence is from you know on, on the Ukraine stuff from from uh, companies that are on the ground there. Um, are they, you know, getting concerned about their operations in China if? Um, you know, if, if China is hit with sanctions, secondary sanctions, uh, you know, related to uh, the Ukraine sanctions, um, you know, for for assisting for assisting Russia, if that were to, to come to pass, or are they are they right. plans uh, to you know continue right. plans for that? Anyway, okay, thanks. yeah, no, thank you, David. Those are great uh, great questions. I, I would note that uh, on uh, for the phase one, uh, we were big supporters of the phase one. And I think that the numbers bear us out. Um, we saw, as I noted, uh, an overall 35% increase in agriculture exports as reported by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, our numbers break that down differently um, 
you have to include meat and uh, poultry and, and, and whatnot. Uh, and that was uh, a, a huge deliverable of the phase one exports, uh, of the phase one agreement. Um, so uh, give credit where credit is due. I think that um, also on the energy side, um, what we saw was uh, over the course of 2021, an increase in price um, uh, and also simultaneously an increase in volume. And uh, can you attribute that to the phase one agreement? Well, in part. Um, uh, it's really more the market uh, facilitated uh, by the phase uh, one agreement. The other area uh, that I think has benefited, you know, actually quite substantially by the phase one agreement is when you look at the pharma, uh, the pharmaceutical uh, export numbers. Um, and, and again, teasing this out uh, uh, from, is it the phase one agreement and improved intellectual property rights or is it uh, Chinese uh, regulatory um, changes uh, welcoming uh, more uh, orphan drugs and making it easier to introduce uh, pharma uh, to the Chinese uh, market? It's hard to, to say explicitly. Um, but uh, I would note uh, that uh, in the three largest areas of uh, uh, growth, uh, they're all uh, focal points of the phase one uh, agreement. So. At least we would evaluate it uh, pretty success successfully, pretty positively. Um, I think that your questions are are vis-a-vis are, -vis the future are are really uh, good, um, and um, w we don't know the answer. Uh, and uh, USTR has not uh, really indicated. Um, but let me note on uh, the uh, three hundred one tariffs or the. The, the, the potential for 301 tariffs and US government policies, that there's a, a, a few things uh, that we're looking uh, for. Uh, will there be uh, a new investigation? Uh, um, uh, Ambassador Tai has spoken of, of new tools. Uh, uh, might that be in the form of a, an investigation, particularly over subsidies? And when would, uh, that would only be an investigation, it wouldn't be new tariffs. Uh, but we would uh, be looking uh, for that as potentially a harbinger of, of new tariffs. We're also interested in uh, the pending uh, litigation. Uh, hundreds of companies are challenging list three and uh, list four uh, tariffs uh, in the courts, and, and we don't know where, where that will end up. And also, um, yeah, you know, what, what will happen with exclusions? Uh, uh, 186 uh, congressional representatives have called for a new exclusion process. Uh, that's a big number. And uh, I know that USTR uh, 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 is sensitive uh, to that. But the previous exclusion process was very narrow. Uh, and, and therefore, the Chinese exclusion process is also probably going to be quite narrow. So we really don't know uh, what will be uh, the impact uh, of, of, the, 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 of future policy. And that is, uh, of course, a, a cause of uh, concern. Um, Catherine, uh, Ambassador Tai has noted uh, that uh, they will be um, uh, announcing things shortly, but uh, we don't know what uh, that will be. I would say uh, on the Chinese side uh, that uh, there are a lot of things uh, that we don't know. Um, uh, particularly uh, uh, yesterday, uh, I think, uh, don't quote me on this, but there were some 13,000 uh, people in Shanghai uh, who uh, newly came down with Omicron version of COVID, uh, a, a large number. <laughs> And uh, uh, there is a, a bit of a, uh, a serious situation in Shanghai. Uh, we don't know how that will impact ports. We don't know how that will impact consumption. We don't know uh, if that will spread. We hope not. Uh, but uh, COVID has had an enormous impact on markets around the world. And we don't know how the Chinese government will react if it, uh, heaven forbid, uh, does uh, spread. Uh, so that I think is a major uh, uh, a major concern. You noted um, uh, if uh, the uh, the Chinese side uh, supports uh, Russia, then it's a bit of a hypothetical question, but it's a real question. Um, 
And so I think uh, we owe it to ourselves to be to be honest and, and clear about this. I think that the administration uh, uh, from Jake Sullivan has uh, indicated uh, very clearly uh, that uh, should uh, China provide uh, arms uh, to Russia for the use in Ukraine, uh, that they that will have economic consequences. And I, uh, while the administration has not specified what those economic consequences will be, um, I can only assume that it will impact upon American companies and American uh, uh, workers, uh, as well as uh, on uh, China. Um, I think that uh, uh, what that would be would really depend on uh, what type of aid or what type of equipment is sent uh, to Ukraine. Um, and it also depends uh, probably on uh, a European uh, and uh, a Japanese response as well. Uh, the administration, I think, is very rightly proud of its uh, uh, collective response with European, uh, Japanese, and Asian um, uh, partners uh, to Russia. Uh, does that imply that should China provide weapons or, or other countries uh, to uh, Russia for use in Ukraine, that we would also see uh, collective action? I don't know the answer to that. Um, uh, but I think it's an important uh, question that we should ask ourselves. Uh, I am hopeful uh, that the Chinese side will refrain uh, from uh, supporting Russia in any way. Uh, 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 to aid um, uh, its aggression and, and inhumane uh, attacks uh, on another uh, U United Nations sovereign nation, uh, and that we won't face uh, those, uh, those uh, problems in our uh, trade uh, in the future. But we have to think about that and worry uh, about uh, continued sanctions, uh, what form they might take uh, by either the U.S. government or the Chinese government uh, as we enter into yet a more uncertain, uh, murky, and volatile uh, 2022. The future has, uh, uh, for American exporters of goods and services, has never been murkier. Um, uh, and that lack of certainty uh, is uh, deleterious uh, to our longer term economic health uh, and our bilateral uh, relations. Um, governments should provide certainty uh, for citizens and businesses to plan their businesses. Uh, at this stage, we're looking at uh, enormous uncertainty uh, against which uh, we need to plan our lives in our businesses. Thank you. Okay, we have another one here from Maoling Xiong. Uh, Maoling, I just allowed you to talk. If you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Maoling. How are you? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Craig. Uh, excellent uh, report and great uh, presentation. Um, I also have two questions. Firstly, just to follow up on the uh, 301 exclusion. Uh, you said uh, it's, uh, it might have this uh, process started to review, and uh, I know it mostly impact U.S. Import, uh, Chinese uh, U.S. imports from China. But do you think um, a broader uh, exclusion potentially would have impact on U.S. exports to China as well? Uh, and the second question is about service re uh, service exports. You talk about there is a lag in data, um, and I see there the, the biggest component is education, and you mentioned there might be factors like pandemic and maybe visa. Uh, so when data comes for 2021, do you expect um, there is a rebound uh, in terms of service exports? And also, how about your expectation for this year? Thank you. Okay, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, thank you. Let me answer the first question first. Uh, uh, it, it's a little bit easier. Um, um, on uh, 
the services uh, side, uh, I think it's all a COVID story, uh, uh, or not all. Uh, there are other factors involved, uh, but it's uh, really about uh, personal and business travel, which has really been cut uh, almost completely. Um, and uh, uh, thus far in 2022, uh, it's nearly impossible uh, to travel between the two countries. Um, and so it's not reasonable to expect a rebound in outbound Chinese tourism to the United States in, in the first six months of 2022. Uh, after that, um, I, if, if we are behind, if COVID is behind us, hopefully uh, we will see that. Um, I, I think that we see a, a great rebound in international travel to the United States uh, I don't have those numbers. Uh, I doubt that we're up to pre-pandemic, uh, but uh, certainly that's not true in China. And I think that uh, the ultimate story there is uh, when uh, when are Chinese going to start traveling internationally again? And as soon as we uh, uh, see that, uh, we'll see big increases in uh, travel and hopefully uh, you know, uh, uh, a rebound uh, to previous levels and beyond uh, in um, the second half of 2022 and, and 2023. But that's about COVID and um, uh, I'm not able to predict what COVID will, will, will do. Let me talk about the exclusions a little bit. Um, both countries uh, have tariffs and both countries have exclusions. And uh, you're 100% right, Mao Ling, uh, that USTR exclusion process uh, impacts upon US importers of Chinese products. But the Ministry of Finance also runs an exclusion process. And that is somewhat uh, predicated on uh, the US exclusion process. In other words, the Ministry of Finance uh, is more generous. Uh, uh, in providing exclusions when USDR is uh, more uh, generous. And uh, thus far, I would say there's a little bit of asymmetry there. Uh, the exclusions that we've seen from the Ministry of Finance have been uh, considerably more and have allowed in uh, a larger amount of imports uh, uh, than the exclusions offered by USDR. And I think that, that uh, the reason for that is that uh, China uh, had taken on uh, obligations uh, or commitments uh, to uh, increase uh, double uh, uh, exports from 2017 level uh, by 2021. Um, and th that's why the Ministry of Finance has you know, been providing exclusions in all of those areas that were mentioned in that. Uh, uh, my understanding is that uh, on the Chinese side is that if a Chinese importer requested an exclusion and it was in the categories uh, within uh, the, the four industries mentioned uh, in the agreement that that exclusion was automatic. Um, uh, so that's a different approach uh, to the exclusions given by USTR. And it has facilitated US exports of many goods, those that were covered on the agreement, but not all US exports. So uh, we want to, uh, a broad exclusion process, preferably by both countries, which could really be very helpful in terms of overall productivity, in terms of bringing down inflation, in terms of increasing choice, and in terms of uh, uh, help, helping uh, American uh, companies and consumers bring down uh, costs. Um, but we see no sign uh, or no good signs of negotiations going on or discussions uh, on this between the two governments. And so we're in a little bit of a wait and see mode, encouraging both governments, if they're not going to withdraw the tariffs permanently, at least offer more exclusions uh, to uh, increase the competitiveness of markets and bring down costs. So I hope that that is helpful. We are at the top of the hour, but there's still some questions left. Craig, do you want to take a couple lightning I'm, I'm round okay ones? With, yeah, sure. Uh, 
Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll be more concise. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, Meng Tang Chen, I've just allowed you to talk if you want to answer. There you go. Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Meng Tong. Hi, how are you? Uh, I have a question about uh, uh, can you walk us through a little bit more about why the U.S. export to China hit all-time high despite the tariffs are still on and you know the pandemic is still going. So what is the main momentum for that? Oh yeah, no, thank you. Uh, well, it's clearly uh, seen uh, and it goes back to Mao Ling's question about exclusions that the Ministry of Finance uh, has offered uh, uh, exclusions uh, in the agricultural area uh, and in the energy area such that uh, 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 American exports have done very well. In addition to that, uh, you know, the Chinese market in 2021 grew at a, a solid 8%, as you know, 8.1%. Uh, and, and so Chinese markets have been very, very good. So uh, it is because of a good, strong domestic growth in China and also uh, the exclusions offered by the Ministry of Finance that we see uh, this relatively robust growth uh, in, in U.S. exports. It's pretty clear that those are the two defining uh, reasons. Uh, next. So we'll take one from the Q&A box. Um, Yifan Xu wrote, uh, given the current state of the pandemic and other circumstances, when do you expect US services exports to China could resume? If the overall US-China relationship struggles to return to normal in the visible future, how will it affect trade between the two countries and the US economic recovery? Yeah, you know, I think on the services side, it is really a COVID story. Uh, and I, I just am unable to predict the future course of the uh, pandemic. Um, and, but we've got to get over COVID before services exports uh, uh, and international tr travel returns in full. Uh, we want that to happen tomorrow, uh, but it's not. Uh, uh, so that is a COVID uh, uh, story. In terms of uh, the impact of overall tension within the bilateral relationship and the impact on exporters, I, I, I agree uh, that um, particularly investments uh, going both ways are heavily impacted by uh, the tensions. Uh, trade less so. Um, and we did see an increase in Chinese investment into the United States last year, as well as uh, an increase in U.S. investment uh, in China. And despite COVID, China had a record of, of, of foreign direct investment inflows in 2021, which is really interesting, um, according to global data. Um, uh, so... Uh, um, Investment flows uh, continue, trade flows are strong, uh, despite uh, the uh, overall uh, geopolitical and diplomatic uh, environment. Uh, will that continue? Uh, will we be able to have a robust year of growth in 2022? Uh, I think that the answer to that really uh, is unknown. Um, it will depend on uh, domestic Chinese markets uh, and uh, the future bilateral relationship, which is under immense strain uh, now and will come under more strain uh, if uh, the Chinese government supports uh, the Russian war effort. Um, and so I'm very uh, uncertain uh, about the future and uh, unable uh, to predict whether the last uh, two years of really solid growth uh, will continue into 2022. We will, USCBC will be working uh, for stability, uh, for growth, uh, for a constructive relationship between the two countries, but we recognize uh, that many of the issues between the two countries are not business issues, there are larger issues which the business community cannot uh, directly uh, impact. Uh, nonetheless, we uh, feel that we are a balancing uh, and uh, a ballast uh, a function uh, within the relationship. And we want to uh, continue to deliver benefits uh, for both sides. 
and to deepen our relationships uh, with our Chinese customers and Chinese uh, consumers and continue to be a good partner, a uh, business partner in the Chinese context as we go forward uh, into 2022 uh, and uh, beyond. Uh, whether or not we will be able to do that uh, will be the decision of uh, the two governments uh, upon which uh, we uh, uh, we uh, do business. Um, so let me leave it there. Um, I will note that the report is live now, so you can find it at uschina.org slash report. Okay, so let me thank everyone uh, for joining this press conference. Let me thank uh, Ian and Aaron and Doug on our team. Uh, if you have further questions or would like to reach out to any of us, uh, please feel free to do so. If you're interested in uh, some of the specific stories of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises from 50 states, uh, look at our website, and we're happy to put you in touch with folks. Uh, and we are grateful for your attention uh, to uh, U.S.-China uh, trade. Thank you very much, and have a great day.